Hello and welcome to yet another session where we sit down together and work on one particular, one specific aspect of our preparation that takes our performance, our squads, our percentiles to the next level, to the next league. Ah, so I welcome you to Baiju's exam prep channel that is dedicated to your success as a B-School aspirant. In this session, we are going to focus on reading comprehension, specifically philosophy-based passages. My name is Vikrant. I have been teaching students for the last 22 years and I act as your personal coach for all things related to English and communication right here on this particular channel. And in between, if you happen to have any question, any concern, any issue, please don't forget to reach out to me using the chat window. I definitely try to accommodate as many of your questions as I possibly can. Uh, and uh, now why philosophy? Why these genres? So normally, when I think of reading comprehension, uh, I tend to divide it into chapters. I tend to divide it into learning objectives. So of course, there are some things which are skills. We of course need to go ahead and work on them. We have taken sessions on skills in the past. We'd be taking more sessions moving forward. But uh, at the end of the day, when you look at quant, you look at chapters and then you go through those. Similarly, when I look at reading comprehension, I think of it as chapters. So which all chapters? There are these 20 different question types that get asked in reading comprehension. So each one of those question type becomes a chapter. I need to master it. I need to understand what this question is all about. I need to figure out how to approach this question type. I need to learn the right way of eliminating close answer choices in that particular question type. And if I still keep on getting that question type wrong, hey, I need to know what kind of skill underpins that question type so that then I can of course focus my attention on enhancing or developing that particular skill. Another set of things that can be turned into a learning objective or a chapter is the area that the passage belongs to. See, part of the problem that we face is from the subject matter of the passage. So if the passage is from uh, an area, a topic that you are unfamiliar with, worse still, if that area happens to have a lot of technical words or jargon, you may face some issues. Uh, and especially for those areas that get asked frequently in the CAT, you cannot afford to be in a situation where you are unfamiliar. So one such area that is not very prominent over the course of last two, three years is philosophy. So if I look at the last five odd years, you'd probably be able to see that around 8%, 9% of the passages uh, were uh, either based on philosophy or brushed on, touched upon philosophy. Huh. In the past, the emphasis on philosophy was far more pronounced and therefore I mean in the big picture scenario it is one of those areas that we can say is uh, very close to the heart of the IIMs and they would like like you to study it so when we say philosophy there are a lot of different branches there remember so we have epistemology we have ethics and we have logic and all that right so out of all of these epistemology is something from which we have received quite a few passages concepts that are related to justice uh, have again been areas that uh, the previous papers have focused a fair bit on we have also had our brushes with topics that were dealing with ethics you know finding out what is right and what is wrong uh, a couple of passages have also focused on the philosophy of education for that matter. So these are the kind of areas that you would definitely want to be familiar with. So if you witness a trend, if you notice that when it comes to philosophy based passages, you happen to have a bit of a struggle, I would recommend that you go and become familiar with philosophy. Okay. So how would you become familiar with philosophy one way is that you read a lot of articles huh? Eon essays remember there is an entire section the other one is to read at least one introductory text to philosophy here is my recommendation you can read Sophie's world by Jostian Gardier or you can read the story of philosophy by Will Durant pick up one of these two go through that at leisure although we have a hundred odd days to the cat so not exactly a lot of leisure but <laughs> uh, at least go through it at a pace that uh, makes you equip yourself to deal with philosophy at the earliest. So that's what we are really going to 
talk about today. So before I go ahead and dive into our passages, we have an All India Open mock happening on the 11th of August. If you have not registered for it so far, please register it. If you are already a Baiju student, you won't need to do that. But if you are not a Baiju student, well, this gives you a fabulous opportunity to benchmark yourself against the competition. So don't miss out on this. And with that, let's dive into our first passage. So take a deep breath. And slowly exhale through your mouth. Hmm. So just think of getting into that groove of reading comprehension. Feel that all the distractions are melting away and now you are thoroughly focused on the screen. You are thoroughly focused on what is right ahead of you. So normally when I give you a passage, I go paragraph by paragraph. Now the passage that I have, the first one is a passage that talks about one of the most influential Western philosophers and that is Plato. In fact, one particular author said that all the philosophical writings that have happened after Plato are nothing but footnote to Plato. It's that big a name in Western philosophy. Now I picked up an extract that actually had two paragraphs, but the first paragraph is very big. And therefore, I was forced to break it down into three slides. Huh? So you won't see a complete paragraph, but a part of the paragraph for the first three slides. And then, of course, the fourth one is going to be the complete paragraph. So the moment you are done reading whatever is on the screen, let me know so that I can take you over to the next slide. Okay. So here is your passage. Princey, I will address your question once we are done with the first passage along with the questions. In IFT exam, uh, let's not be too quick. Let, let, let us wait for the official confirmation. I will tell you why this thought has been circulating around in a while. Okay, here you go. Oh, Princey, that was fast. Good job. So taking you over to the next slide now in five seconds. Thank you. 
Mm, Prinzi, I am not going to answer this question right now for some reason, but we'll look at it later. Okay, next. Fantastic. So this takes care of the first paragraph. Breathless, right? Such a long paragraph and philosophical texts can at times do that to us. Here is the last, here is the second and the last paragraph for the passage, of the passage for you. Done? Fantastic. So, can somebody tell us what the passage is about? And could you also share how comfortable you were reading it? Was there something that was tricky for you to understand? See, this passage actually talks about one of the very key ideas propagated by Plato, which was talked about in the very first paragraph. It is a world of shadows. And our mind knows the reality. This world is an imperfect copy of that reality. Right? So, there's a very famous uh, metaphor that is used, a metaphor of a cave, where all of us are in a cave, we are looking away from the entrance, we cannot turn back and look at the entrance. Uh, so there are these things outside, the light falls on those things and the shadow is formed on the wall in front of us. We look at those shadows and we think that oh this is the world but that shadow is a mere reflection of that ultimate reality. For example, what is a square? All of us know what a square is. Now if I draw something here, is this a square? Most of us will look at it and say, ha, huh, this is a square, but then it is, if you look at it, it is not exactly a square. All the four sides are not exactly the same. It's an approximation, right? Yet we know, but in our mind, we have that idea of a square. But in this world, the squares that we see are not perfect. They are approximations. Those, those are the kind of ideas that uh, Plato really goes ahead and talk about. Na, 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 princey, no. That will go a little far away. But anyhow, let us look at the questions first. Then we can come back to the passage and talk a little more about it if needed. So here is the first question. According to the passage, what is the most fundamental distinction in Plato's philosophy? A, B, C, D, all yours. Go ahead, give it a shot. 
and uh, share the answer with me. Okay, so Vanchita has started off our quest for the answer. Prasanna, I see that. Okay, two more answers, give me two more answers. Okay, Vinayak, waiting for one more answer. Okay, so, so far we have four B's and one B versus C. Okay, so let us see. Let me take you back to one tiny little part. Mm, this part. So, I am just highlighting something for you. This sentence. Now, you notice the use of the word most. The most fundamental distinction in Plato's philosophy is between this and that. So there are other distinctions, but that particular part, that particular segment has been labeled as the most fundamental distinction. So I hope that leads us to B. So is A something stated in Plato's philosophy? Yes. But is it is it being called the most fundamental distinction? No. Similarly, when you look at uh, uh, option C, is that what was called most fundamental distinction? The most fundamental distinction is between things that are beautiful and the concept of beauty. Right? So there is this concept of justice. And it is because of that concept that you look at different acts and you can call them just, right correct so that's that's the difference that was talked about as the most fundamental distinction on our second slide and that is why we can go ahead and choose b this actually turns out to be a specific detail question but because the passage itself was challenging uh, because it is difficult to create that mental overview when you are unfamiliar it can uh, affect your ability to go back and refer to the right part uh, socially bifurcation means dividing something into two parts okay dividing something into two parts here is your next question and Princey now you would know why I did not answer the question that you had asked earlier because I wanted to ask it Hmm. So, the correct answer here would actually be D. So, corporal is physical. Remember corporal, corporal punishment, it is basically found there. Corporeal is essentially related to the body. 
Ah, so when we say related to the body, it is basically as opposed to being spiritual. So you know you happen to have this spiritual realm. So when we write corporeal, we say that hey, we are not talking about uh, the spiritual realm. We are talking about the realm of the bodies. Okay, so that is why bodily is the best answer for us here. Uh, and here is the next question for you. According to the passage, the soul what do you think? Vedant, the options were really close, okay? Spiritual was the only one that was easy for us to rule out. But the way corporeal was used in the context of this passage as opposed to spiritual, that contrast helped us limiting it or narrowing it down to bodily. In some other context, you can actually use it as physical or material, yes. But if the way it is used in the passage, bodily will be the most uh, appropriate choice for us. Okay. So, yes, the correct answer here is B. If you look at A and C, both of these are false. Both of these contradict what the passage very clearly, very explicitly states about the soul. Ah, should I take you back? I think it's always great to refer to the right area and then see. This is where soul should be. Soul always retains the ability to recollect what it once grasped of the forms. It does not depend on the existence of the body for its functioning and in fact grasp the nature of the forms far more easily when it is not encumbered by its attachment to anything corporeal. Now you notice this context of corporeal will very clearly makes it uh, bodily related to body when it is free of the body it understands things easily ah, so a is definitely false uh, c is definitely false both of these contradict what was stated in the paragraph and d uh, the soul is permanently associated with one person only it is not even mentioned in the passage so this is something that cannot be determined. B on the other hand is true. That is consistent with what the passage says and that is why our answer here should be option B. Right? I hope that helps Sushri. And here is your fourth question. According to the passage, Plato's A, B, C or D. So, what's your take? So, Prasanna has chosen to go with D. What about the rest of us? Should I give you a hint? Now that some time has elapsed, you should refer to the last paragraph. 
No? In fact, there are only two paragraphs, right? So, the one on the last slide. Amorphous is shapeless, something that does not have any definite or defined shape. So let me take you to the last paragraph. I'm sure you've used the seeker to refer to that, but here you go. Many of his greatest admirers and most careful students point out that few, if any of his writings can accurately be described as mere advocacy of a cut and dried group of prepositions and this part. Often Plato's works exhibit a certain degree of dissatisfaction and puzzlement with even those doctrines that are being recommended for our consideration. So, Plato himself was dissatisfied and puzzled by some of the uh, things that he said, some of the uh, hypotheses that he came with the ones that we are being asked to consider. Okay? So, what can we come up with from this? So, let us look at option A. Plato's arguments were not unambiguous, means Plato's arguments were ambiguous and non-definitive. So, were they ambiguous? Yes. Cut and dried, remember that part. And non-definitive, yes, it can. you can actually infer this from the second last sentence of the passage. And uh, if I look at B, we can choose amorphous, but the problem is with self-contradictory. This is not a part that can be inferred. Look at C. Uh, Plato's works revealed that Plato was at times unhappy and perplexed by his own postulations. Yes, dissatisfied, puzzled. So, unhappy and perplexed are basically synonyms of those two words. So, C can also be arrived at on the basis of the last sentence of the passage. And therefore, uh, because A and C both can be arrived at, we should opt for D as our answer. So, there you go. Uh, so, we started with Plato and now let us get into a passage that takes us through or that wades through some of the jargon that at times makes our job tough, makes our job difficult. So, get ready, make that mental switch and here we go. Oh, prior to this, Princey asked me a question. Princey asked me about 90 percentile. Huh? How many marks are needed for 90 percentile? Let's not talk about 90 percentile. Okay, let's talk about 99. We are aiming to be in the top 100, uh, top 1 percent at least. Okay, so in CAT 2021, uh, a score of around 44 was needed to get a 99 percentile and in CAT 2022 a score of uh, 38 and a half led to a 99 percentile so which basically translates into 15 questions net correct out of 24 and in 22 you are targeting 13 questions net correct. So, if you are looking for, if you are gunning for 80 percent accuracy, then can I say that you are basically going to attempt somewhere between I would say 18 to 20 questions with 80 percent accuracy and you are done, you are good to go, that will take you to the top 1 percent. Okay, not very difficult, right? Doable, immensely doable. Huh, if you are absolutely sensational at say either quant or DILR and you believe that's where you are going to get your competitive advantage from, even if you are at around 95 percentile in English, it would work. But when you are preparing, why not really keep these as targets? You know? Okay, so here is the passage once again. Shoot.
So, in this uh, particular uh, passage, I will take you through paragraph by paragraph. And do let me know if you are struggling with any word on uh, this slide, in this paragraph. I'd love to help you with that. Fabulous. So, Nali, that was fantastic. Good. Nidhi, anything that uh, you want to talk about? Any word or jargon that you want to talk about which is on this particular paragraph? See, the moment you know some of these key terms that are mentioned here, that understanding will suddenly unlock the entire meaning and make it very easy for you to understand it. If you already know those terms, absolutely great. You know, kudos to you. A pat on the back for you. So, shall we move on? Antagonistic would basically mean opposite, inimical, hostile, contradictory. Aishu, I think you are not exactly live at the moment. Huh? So just try and see if you can join us live. You probably are lagging by around uh, 30 odd seconds. Okay, so here is the next paragraph for you. Fabulous. Two of you have told me that you're done reading it. Anyone else? Just, I need two more people to confirm that they are done and we shift. Okay, Sri. And here is the next paragraph.
So, this is just a sentence. So, taking you over to the next slide now, I hope you have read it. So, Sonali and Nidhi are very consistently being the first ones here. Next, so this is the second last slide of the passage, second last paragraph. Okay. And here is the last paragraph. So ready for the questions now? Okay. So here is the first one. According to the passage, Romanticism did not, what would you mark as your answer?
okay so absolutely spot on the right answer is c a and d are contradictory to the passage so when you say romanticism did not include any place for reason uh, remember that paragraph which begin with third third reason third said the romantic elevation of aesthetic feeling and the creative imagination did not come at the price of their faith in and respect for reason so option c is eliminated option a is once again eliminated from that extract so that single paragraph single sentence helps you rule out uh option a sorry and option c is something that you can uh, arrive at on the basis of that extract and one so option a contradicts that option c is consistent with that that is why we have marked it religious deities have not been mentioned in the passage so this is something that will go beyond the scope advocate unconstrained feelings is once again false on the basis of the passage in fact if you look at uh, this paragraph that talks about briefly this response you know this romanticism to the enlightenment heralded individual subjectivity and the free expression of unconstrained feelings as the proper replacement for the values of the enlightenment so they uh, so you would look at that and uh, you would notice that option d contradicts it it in fact advocated unconstrained feelings and not the opposite so d is also ruled out so see it is here is the next question for you which of the following is not a characteristic of romanticism this can be close for some of us okay so a lot of us have answered so see some of us have taken d now there is a paragraph which talks about frederick jacobi Uh, remember the Stromund Rang movement. Uh, in that, only when striving towards truth and knowledge, and I'm just reading the relevant part out. Only when striving towards truth and knowledge can a spirit be called a philosophical spirit. So it means that philosophy and the seeking of knowledge was a part of romanticism. So when you say exclusion of philosophy and of seeking knowledge. is that a characteristic no it was a part hmm so d can definitely be had from this now when i said that this is going to be close for some of us the issue was basically c versus d why uh c says a belief in the primacy of rational criticism now in this a belief in the primacy primacy of rational criticism was a characteristic of the enlightenment romanticism did not contradict it romanticism did not forsake it right it does not mean that it uh, that it uh, basically thought of it as uh, the primary thing so the issue is c and d both of them are not characteristics of romanticism a and b both of them are and thus we have to choose one so between c and d which one is better so at least in c we know that they believed in rational criticism it is the primacy part where we have a problem d is wrong in its entirety 
and that is why d scores over c and thus we should go ahead and choose d as our answer okay here is the next one question number 7 quick let me see do we have another session at 1 pm today because if we do then i may need to go a tad bit slow tad bit fast sorry oh yes we do have a session with saral sir at 1 cat dilr so let's just wind it up quickly so that you have enough time to grab a quick bite So what's your answer guys, what's your answer? So Prasanna is the first one, Sri is another. So romanticism would not have been possible without enlightenment. That is true. In fact, let me just take you back. Where is that relevant part? See, see this part would have been impossible independently of key enlightenment thinkers. So it would have been impossible independently, which meant, which means that you needed enlightenment thinkers, right? Otherwise, all of those thoughts would not have been possible. So A is true. Romanticism precedes enlightenment, false, it came afterwards, look at the first paragraph, C. hostile to the core values of enlightenment, no, it in fact, the core value of enlightenment is what, trust in reason, rational criticisms, romanticism also believes in this, so this also false, D, romanticism discontinued the enlightenment's call to submit every belief and every action to the authority of rational criticism, no, it did not discontinue it, in fact, uh, it is continuous with the enlightenment's commitment to the value of rational criticism says the second paragraph. So D can also be termed false on the base of the passage. So which one of the following is true? A and therefore that is the one that we should have marked as our answer. Okay. So that's about the passage and here is something for your mind. Whoever said it is not whether you win. Hi, I think I lost you guys very briefly. Hmm, it seems that I lost you guys briefly and uh, Hopefully now you should be able to see me and hear me. Let me just ensure that everything is being streamed correctly at least. There are some issues. There is some, I think there is something that must have happened at my end that maybe some software glitch or whatever anyhow so it's not whether you win or lose that counts is said by people who lo who lost okay so <laughs> with that just a quick reminder that you are supposed to register for the all india open mock that is starting from the 11th of august and for more practice you can consider enrolling to our test series which gives you a ton of benefits Okay, and if you want to be one of these toppers, you can join our comprehensive course 
in order to experience it, you can unlock a free three-day trial. You can also sit for a scholarship test on 13th of August. And all of these things will make this course absolutely tempting for you. So that's it from me today. Uh, in case you happen to have any other doubts, issues, concerns, please make sure that you reach out to us on uh, these platforms and we would love to help you. We would get back to you as soon as we can with as thorough an answer as we can offer. Right? So that's it from me today. Have a nice day. Take a quick break and then come back for Saral Sir's session. Until then, have fun and keep working hard. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day.